largest statues ever created, fully as long as the Eiffel Tower. Dr. Tarzi intends to find it. Since the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha by the Taliban, the people of Bamiyan and Afghanistan have been searching for a way to avenge what the Taliban did. If I find it, I will offer up the thousand-foot Buddha as a response to the Taliban by the people of Bamiyan and Afghanistan. Discovering the sleeping Buddha would be sweet justice indeed, the best possible gift Dr. Tarzi could give his homeland. Still, its last recorded sighting was more than a thousand years ago. Has the sleeping Buddha truly survived Afghanistan's tumultuous history? And in the vastness of Bamiyan Valley, how does he even know where to look? On a busy thoroughfare in Kabul, another giant of archaeology is also looking for the past. And for Russian archaeologist Viktor Saryanidi, seeing ruined Kabul for the first time in more than two decades is bittersweet. Already, he confronts memories of a younger self in a gentler era. On my way from the airport, I was looking around and there was nothing I could see that was familiar to me. That almost made me cry. Dr. Sarianidi has been invited back to Kabul because the treasure that brought him fame may have returned from oblivion. Called the Bactrian Horde, it is a collection of some 20,000 gold burial objects forged in the first century AD. In the 1980s, it vanished melted down by warlords, it was rumored, or given as tribute to terrorist leader Osama bin Laden. Now, a treasure said to be the hoard has been found hidden beneath the presidential palace. Tomorrow, Sarianidi will be the guest of honor when the treasure is opened. He will settle once and for all one of the greatest archeological mysteries of our time. It began on a hill much like this one called Tila Tepe in northern Afghanistan. It was 1978, and Viktor Sarianidi was leading a joint Soviet-Afghan excavation. One day, he found the ground strewn with gold. Of course I was overwhelmed. We were used to finding ceramics, bits and pieces of pottery, but definitely not gold. In disbelief, Sarianidi and his team uncovered one grave after another, five women and one man. Each had been entombed with a king's ransom of plates, ornaments, baubles, all solid gold. Sarianidi estimated they had died around the time of Christ, and their burial objects told him they were probably royalty from a mysterious and warlike people. They were Bactrian nomads who'd grown rich, sacking cities left behind by Alexander the Great and preying on Silk Road caravans. They seemed to like flashy gold jewelry, which would glitter across the wide open spaces of their homeland. But Sarianidi and his team had little time to draw conclusions. The graves had to be excavated and fast. Already, they'd amassed more gold objects than were found in King Tut's tomb. Moscow showed keen interest in the spectacle and sent the KGB to guard the dig. The Afghan army installed soldiers. Sarianidi cataloged the objects at double, triple the normal pace. There was more to discover, but time ran out. Sarianidi accompanied the priceless treasure back to the National Museum of Afghanistan in Kabul. But not long after, 
the Bactrian horde disappeared as Afghanistan dissolved into chaos. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded. For 10 years, they battled the Mujahideen, Afghan guerrillas, in a war so costly, it helped bring down the Soviet Union. When the Soviets were driven out, Afghan warlords battled over the spoils. Their shelling destroyed half of Kabul. In 1993, a rocket crashed into the National Museum, one of the last known homes of the Bactrian Horde. It was feared that most of its antiquities had by now been destroyed or looted. And it was about to get even worse. In 1996, the Taliban, a militia made up of Islamic fundamentalists, pushed back the warlords and seemed to offer peace. Yet one of their first acts in Kabul was to lynch the former Soviet-appointed president, Mohammad Najibullah. According to legend, he was the last person to lay eyes on the Bactrian horde. Haji Mullah Kaksar was once the Taliban Deputy Minister of Interior Affairs. He recalls how the Taliban defeated chaos and crime with strict new rules. Basically, the Taliban offered a law, the law of the Quran. For example, if someone steals something, we cut off his hand. And if someone commits murder, we execute him. These are the very orders of the Quran. But the harsh treatment of women disturbed Kaksar. So did the Taliban's war on art, inspired by the Quran. The Quran prohibits portraying living things. If a person makes a portrait of another person, on Judgment Day, Allah will tell him, you have competed with me. Now give it a soul and make it come to life. In other words, drawing or sculpting living things is an affront to the Almighty. Thus, Taliban radicals came to see the destruction of ancient art, like the Bamayan Buddhas, as the fulfillment of Quranic law. And now the destruction shifted into high gear. At the National Museum, Taliban thugs smashed hundreds of pieces of art. At the presidential palace, they slashed forbidden paintings. The nation's entire film archive some 50 years of history on film began going up in smoke. And under an increasingly radical ideology, the Taliban began destroying lives. The Taliban would say, the Hazaras are not Muslims. We should kill the Hazaras. Bamiyan native Mirza Asim is a member of the Hazara ethnic minority. In the Sacred Valley, he witnessed the Taliban's campaign of ethnic cleansing. Once, I went to a place. There was a mass grave of 200 people. In another place, there was another mass grave of 200. They killed two to 3,000 in all. In one raid, Asim claims, two of his children died of fright. He thought the Taliban couldn't hurt him anymore. Then, at gunpoint, he was forced to commit an act of infamy. They came to my house. They arrested me in my house. They tied our hands. They.